so this is the second annual Premier Mastering Panel. We've got some real heavy hitters on the uh, panel today, uh, Mark Needham and Tony Maserati. Um, both mixers, producers, engineers, they cover a, a span of, of crafts, and today we're going to focus on mixing more than anything, but the conversation can go multiple places. If anybody wants to interject with a question, just stand up by the mic there, and um, we'll try to get to it as the panel goes. Feel free to, to do that. Um, I'm going to read a quick bio of each of these guys here, just to give you some uh, context and background. Mark, on my far right, is a mixer producer located in LA. He's worked with uh, Chris Isaac, Cake, Fleetwood Mac, Pink, Shakira, Moby, The Killers, Imagine Dragons, Neon Trees, the list goes on. Um, artist development has always, has always been a big part of uh, his company's mission, and his studio, The Ballroom, is located in Griffith Park in Hollywood, and that's a picture of it right there. And to my immediate right is Tony Maserati, a Grammy Award-winning producer, mixer, engineer, who's worked with Beyonce, Mariah Carey, James Brown, Lady Gaga, Notorious B.I.G., Selena Gomez, R. Kelly, the list goes on and on. Uh, his work encompasses worldwide sales in excess of 100 million units. He's won a Grammy Award for his work with Beyonce, uh, earned a Latin Grammy for um, uh, Sergio Mendes, Timeless. He's also got eight additional Grammy nominations. He's an alumni of Berklee College of Music for production and engineering, and has spent time both in New York and L.A. <laughs> He's been credited with helping define the sound of New York hip-hop and R&B through his mixes. He co-founded Mirrorball Entertainment in 2011, a record label, music publishing and production company, and he's located in North Hollywood, California. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my uh, co-host, Michael Romanowski, who is a mastering engineer in San Francisco. And for those that don't know, I'm a mastering engineer in Los Angeles, Gavin Larson. So, uh, AKA Romo, we'll start the process here and feel free to, to interject. Take it away, Romo. Thanks, Gavin, good job. Welcome, guys, thanks for being here. Uh, so, we're talking about mastering, mixing, mastering, uh, mixing uh, super premier guys here. Um, we, one of the first things we wanted to get into, we're, let's just, we're gonna jump straight into a, uh, to a topic of mixing engineers being their own mastering engineers. We all have very strong feelings about that up here, and so we thought we'd throw this off and start with, how do you guys feel about uh, when you're finishing up your mixes? Um, well, for, for one, it's, sort of a, it's a couple part question, but for one, thinking about the idea of um, mixing engineers and mastering engineers, the separation of the, of the two as mixing engineers. You guys, uh, anybody thoughts on that? Microphone? Right. Sorry. Microphone. Sorry, usually I talk <laughs> too loud. Um, you know, I, I, um, it's only recently that, that people even imagine uh, putting out a record that's not been touched by a professional mastering engineer. That's kind of a new concept, certainly for me. Um, and, it's, and, it, and it's not something that I really uh, uh, would ever recommend. Um, Personally, for me, I th I'm thinking about what the mastering engineer is going to do. Maybe not particularly which mastering engineer, but I'm always leaving the mastering engineer some room to do their thing um, when I'm mixing. But I also, I've always felt that the mastering engineer's job is to place that mix in the period that we're in. So when we made vinyl records, the mastering engineer was extremely important in knowing how much bottom end could be put on a vinyl record because the, the, literally the amount of time they could get on that record was based on how they manipulated their lathe and how they manipulated their mastering frequencies. Um, so that was a period of time. And then of course there were cassettes and tapes and all of that sort of thing, and then CDs, and now we have digital downloads and whatnot with MP3s. All of that means that these guys have to create a, a file now that is going to work for this period and the speakers that the audience listens to, right? So he's thinking, my, you know, if I send him a, a Robin Thicke record, he's thinking, okay, who is that audience and, and what, are, what kind of playback system is are they going to have? 
Uh, if I send if I send a jazz record, then he's going to be thinking, well, that's a different playback system, so I'm going to create a different file for that. I'm going to create a different equalization curve, correct? Um, I want them to do that because that's what they do. That's what they think about. Of course, I'm thinking about it in the mix, but really, I want I want my mastering engineer to then sort of refine that make sure my whole album is going to work in that context. So there, to me, the mastering engineer is the guy that's getting it out into the period of time that we are living currently. My mix is for forever, in perpetuity. So it can be remastered in 20 years, if I'm very, very lucky. Um, and that would be for that period of time. Let's face it, all of the Beatles and Led Zeppelin and every classic record that was ever made has been remastered for the time. And that doesn't mean that the other mastering wasn't good, it just means it was meant for that time, that technology. Yeah, I mean, I, I... I'm, the way I mix, I, I, I'm mixing with, with generally the, 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 how I feel, of, you know, how I want the mastering to end up. I'm kind of mixing with that in mind, and I'm listening usually. I'm running two files, a lower and an elevated level, which is what you would probably hear if you were downloading it. And I'm, I'm listening to that usually when I'm mixing just to try to make sure I can get things to fit within that elevated level space. Um, I mean, I'm really looking for... You know, a mastering engineer that I know his work, I've worked with a lot, and, and somebody I can trust to really just have that, you know, c come in with one last fresh perspective and make sure, you know, make sure this, the bottom end is not like I haven't, I haven't gone like a little overboard here. Or, to, you know, just to, to really make song to song feel like it flows from tune to tune as a consistent record level-wise and, and EQ-wise. So th that's one of the main things I look for now that... I mean, that's my perspective has kind of changed from the 1970s to where I am now when I, when I was mixing records in 70s and 80s and even into the early 90s. The, I, you know, especially on the, on, on the vinyl, as Tony was saying, I mean, you, you really looked at the mastering engineer was, you know, I mean, the mastering engineer was God. He's the guy who could make your, who could, you know, who could get it widespread on your toms, still get some bottom, and actually get, you know, be able to fit the whole album, yeah. you know, get all ten songs. You didn't have to drop something or lower the level down. Yeah. Um, you know, I, now I'm really looking for someone who can just, not to second guess myself, but if, if I have somebody I really trust to come in and just have one last look at what I'm doing, you know, and and and. and just keep it consistent and allow it to get on the radio and, and and still get loud without too much bottom, too much top, things like that. So actually, so that, well, let's let's go down that path for a second. So when you're working with a mastering engineer, how much do you rely? So you so you rely on them a little bit about um, getting some feedback. It's good to be able to have some like, hey, here's what I'm hearing in your mixes. Uh, how do you how do you work with that mastering engineer or find somebody who is. Uh, um, who, who makes a good fit? You know, we all have. We work with people, and we have different personalities and different ways of describing things. And so, finding somebody that listens the way you listen to, or um, being able to, to give you some feedback to say, you know what, as a, as the final QC, maybe this is in a good spot. Or, or as the here's the and another point you brought up, uh, the heated mix versus the. Let's talk about something we talked about also earlier. But the, you know, you're delivering to them different types of mixes based on the. Um, maybe who they are too. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm not. I, I, don't, I don't usually look for f feedback on what my mix should sound like from a mastering guy. Okay. I, that, I, I want. I mean, I've worked with people that I know know, know what I do, and you know, uh, I've worked with people who I maybe mix three to five hundred songs a year. I, I, most of them go to the same same few guys just because we work together a lot. They know what my sound is. If they can make my, what I'm doing, if you can get an extra five percent above what I've done. I mean, it's, you know, it gets those small increments. If you can get two or three percent better in the sound than this, and if the mastering engineer can add another five, that can be the difference between this being a big hit and having an impactful sound. I'm not really looking for somebody to give me, tell me what they don't like about my mix, because I don't really, I don't really care. I'm sorry, nothing. Well, maybe, I mean, well, I, I care. I, I, I mean, I care what me and the artist came yeah. up with, and I want somebody to be able to see that vision and take and see. Can you keep keep my vision and just take it? Like, can you take it from 95 to yeah. 
a uh, hundred or something. Well, maybe what I mean by feedback is maybe the idea of that, like, you know what, going through this record, everything has, like, let's just say there's a consistency that it's a little pointy at 270 hertz or something. Is that helpful for you as feedback to know your mix environment? You guys, you guys both work in the same, in your own places, so you're not, uh, you know, you've, you're used to your room, you know that, and so some, for, for some other engineers, maybe that's a little bit more important to have some feedback, but is it still helpful, I guess, on the feedback side? I guess I've never. I mean, I've never really. Yeah. I've never really gotten that sp like specific. You're, you're you're always a little heavy at two seventy or so. I've never. I haven't. I, I haven't really gotten that kind of feedback. Maybe they just fix it. and They don't tell me. You know? <laughs> That's probably the case. But, but whatever. But they're maybe they're just being nice. But, um. Tony, uh, I, you know, I I have to say, I work probably a little bit more closely with my mastering guys because. I don't, I don't necessarily show up to my mastering sessions anymore because I can never make sense of the rooms yeah, that they're I in. I, I just, I don't know that room, that speaker, or whatever it is, so I can't, I can't do that. But, but, you know, I try to, I try to choose the mastering engineer based on the market that my record is going to, and, and based on the the quality at, at, at which they function. Um, and, and at that level, there's not that many guys and that's kind of good. That's okay. Cause they're pretty amazing at that level. Um, I mean, you guys are, you know, you're at the top, top level of what happens in our business. So when I, when I send a mix, I know I'm going to get something back, but I have sent mixes to, to guys who didn't get it. And rather than work too hard to to tweak the the mastering um if it's not the mix isn't the problem uh, i'll just f go to somebody that might be more appropriate and i find that you know songs the same as songs for me that some some things work better for me and <laughs> some things don't you know that's right. why right. we're still working right. um and i and i think the same <laughs> goes for mastering guys it's an interesting point you bring up um in terms of what market you're going for, because this this thing that we do, what we all do, is a is a mixture of art and commerce, you know. But you always have to think about the commerce. The commerce is what keeps you employed. So when you talk about market, it is something to think about. Um, one of the things I've noticed with A and R people in particular is, you know, you touched on it when you will mix something, you'll take all the, you know, uh, the stuff that jacks the level up off to give it to the artist to, to evaluate the mix, but in order to you know, keep the ball rolling in the process of making a record, you also have to show them what it might sound like when it's mastered, even though it's gonna to go to a mastering engineer, because what's happening in the world of a and is um, because you're in a market and because it's, it's, it's art but it's commerce, you always have to uh, realize what you're competing against. So if you're putting out a record, there's a slew of artists there that you have to match up to in terms of your quality of songwriting, but it also your tonal structure, the way that the music impacts you in a pair of earbuds on an MP3 or a high res or anything like that. So, um, you know, the younger crop of A&R people that are coming into the business now are so used to A being to figure out what that competition is that when you are a mixing engineer and you submit a mix, they expect it to sound like everything else. The difference between that mix and everything else 100% of the time is that all that stuff's mastered. One way or the other, it's mastered. Uh, it doesn't matter how, but it's gone through the process of that in order to go into the marketplace. It's the chain of events, and that's the final stage of, of creativity on a music. So, so it's, it's a challenge for us as mastering engineers, and, and it's also a challenge, but yet a different challenge for mixing engineers, because ultimately, everybody's got to stay employed. And we're talking about that. Um, so I, I wouldn't mind elaborating on that from your perspective. I know what my perspective is, which is, and, and I'll just quickly lay it out before, before I'll hand it off. My perspective as a mastering guy, before I even go there, how many people are mastering engineers? And how, how many, many are mixing? Are mixing. So some of you guys are even, and, and ladies too, are, are mixing and mastering at the same time. And that's another trend of new generations coming in. Everybody's now expected to do 10 things. Uh, we're lucky enough to be old guys, and we do one thing, you know? <laughs> Speak um, for yourself. And that's few and far between. But from my perspective, the challenge, which I know is gonna be different than these guys, is I get the mix in 
without all the plugins. And I have to then bring it to a place that the artist has got used to with all the plugins. Sometimes I can present something with a greater depth of field, greater size, perhaps, perhaps not lower in level than what they've been listening to. And the first thing, unless it comes with a lengthy educational process, is, oh, how come it's not as loud as this? So it presents a challenge. I'm used to it. I deal with it. We, we figure out how to stay employed through this all. Um, that's the challenge from my side. And these guys are before our side. I'm interested in your, in your perspective on this, because this has got to do with employment as a mixer. Just, just the fact that, that neither, you know, we both print our mixes. We print two mixes. One is with pre-mastering, and one is without means that we understand that this is a time, a period of time. This phenomena of, of being the loudest is just a phenomena of the current uh, infatuation with technology. And eventually that is going to change. In fact, I'm already seeing uh, several of my clients like insisting that I don't use any kind of maximization. And I still put it on because I'm like, oh, they're not going to like it. Like, it just sounds like I'll just put a little bit on there, you yeah, know, because yeah, I'm like, oh, they can't. How can they possibly listen without this on there? Um, so so I think that that fact alone helps helps you realize that that we're paying attention not only to our marketplace um, and, and, you know, we're using our experience to go beyond the current marketplace, if that means you know, anything. <laughs> I mean, I'm, t I'm usually tailoring. I mean, again, again we're, both running two, we're both running two levels of mixes. I run one that's 6 dB lower. But I'm usually trying to, you know, I, I never send the artist, or um, I would say probably 99% of the time, the artist never gets the, hears the zero files. The label definitely never hears the zero files. Mm -mm. Um, but I tailor the, I'm really trying to tailor the level that I'm printing at to, you know, if I'm working on an EDM record, it's one thing. If I, I'm just doing a Moby a record with Moby, then I'm pulling that back. He wants, you know, he, he, he wants he, it on, on he, maximum. He, he does, I mean, he wants it loud. You know, he started out with softer, and then we've been oh. creeping it up. He's oh, okay. muscle, he wants a little more impact, a little more. But I'm still not getting up to the level of a, you know, of an alternative of Magic Dragons or an alternative yeah. rock thing, where it's just where it's slamming, and that that sometimes that distortion is actually part of what the uh, vibe. What this, yeah. Um, but but then I kind of pass the buck on the level to these guys and make them have the fight about why it has to be a half dB softer. <laughs> well, it's and it's interesting, you know. It, it's interesting the evolution of this, and I think um, what's what's interesting to me is to try to share that with youngsters coming into the industry. We've all been active a pretty long time, and you know, one of the, the guy that I learned this from, Doug Sachs, who who recently passed away, he was one of the original mastering guys, and. Um, I learned so much about the industry through him because of who he was working with in the early days. Um, you know, and we used to have long conversations almost nightly about when this whole thing started. And his philosophy was it started when CDs started going into the car. CDs didn't go into the car when they first came out. So um, all of a sudden, when we were talking before the panel, uh, Mark and I, about uh, making records in the 70s and the dynamic range, you know, you'd get a vinyl ref, you'd put it on, you'd sit, pour a glass of tea or wine and you'd sit back and listen in a beautiful environment, a quiet environment. You put a CD in a car, you got noise all around you. So all of a sudden these low passages need to be brought up. So a compressor does that. So now the trend is, you know, towards getting more of a straight line curve. You still want dynamic range, you always need it. Um, but the struggle is how much of it. So you fight for a dynamic range, and you fight to take it off. It's a, it's a battle against itself. Um, and from there, it went into mobile listening. And we now live in a mobile listening environment. And what's happened because of the straight line curve is you, you get the ability to then turn up your mix without these clipping issues. Now you get tools which will take the clipping down. Uh, the Mastered for iTunes um, system that's out there is actually, they didn't work towards undoing that. They just happen to, by default, uh, increase dynamic range. They give us the abilities to use tools to increase the dyna dynamic range. So perhaps we could talk a little bit about just the evolution of, of all this, because you guys have been making records for a long time, and you know you did this stuff with full dynamic range, and you've seen it go into this. Where is it going from here? What are your feelings? What are your thoughts? What you know? What what's it come to? 
can you still appreciate a great song even though you're you're jamming it all into one corner? Yeah. I mean to me I mean it's a great song, it's a great song. And if you do your mix and the production right, I mean you can have I mean I can have a I can, I can mix a song that looks like a straight di it looks like a straight line dynamic, but it's still from verse to chorus. There's a huge impact, and that's just in you know what instruments you're bringing in where. If you're doing you know if you're doing master fader rides, so there's I mean you, I can still get those dynamics. I don't I don't think that makes a song great. I mean, what makes a song great or not is like do, do, do people give a shit about what you're what you're saying? You know the message. Um, so I, I don't know that that are the I mean hopefully the mix helps convey that that message even stronger whatever the artist is trying to get across but I don't know that that really if that that really affects you know yeah the, the, the overall the, the overall artistry of the song I mean I, I, I think you can make ones that have songs that have great dynamic range that are great songs and some that have and, none and are great songs and that's the focus is you know you got to have a good song and that's another conversation I used to have with Doug is you know if you've got a good song that sounds bad you'll enjoy it. If you've got a bad song that sounds good, who cares? If you got both, you got gold. So do, do you guys suppose that the evolution I is more dependent on the quality of the song and that's why it's less important? You know, these schools I've noticed are churning out kids that don't have this knowledge of why it is the way it is today. Is it important to convey this kind of information? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it's because of where it is, and it's. it's I, I, I mean, look. I think that you know. One thing I wanted to say um, about Mark's comment is, you know, we are given a set of parameters, and those those parameters are that that the audience wants to hear one song on the radio that's similarly uh, limited to the next. And um, I, th I think that I if we can impart anything today, it would be that there still needs to be good mixing techniques to make sure that even if it's just a piano and a vocal, it's, it's compelling, not just because it's loud. Um, but because of the techniques of equalization or the techniques of spatial placement or the techniques of, as Mark was saying, riding the master fader. So the chorus comes in impactfully. Um, and I think that, um, and the same goes for songwriting. Um, you know, so often songwriting today is, is you know, uh, the producer is the songwriter. Just because he happens to be the songwriter, he becomes the producer, which is really a, an interesting thing that's happened in our modern times. Because back in the day, a songwriter would write the song, and then they would hire a producer to produce the song. And now there's not enough money in a business anymore to do that. So they just immediately make somebody who could easily be straight. I, I just did a mix for... Nick Jonas that did really well. And the writer producer is straight out of Berkeley. Um, and he did another song that I mixed, the, the Selena Gomez. And is he a great producer? No. Is, is he a great songwriter? He's, he's pretty damn good. But his production skills, he's still learning. Yeah. You know, he's still understanding the concepts of how do I how do I push back and pull? What is what is tension and release, and and how do I get that? And luckily, he's smart enough to to ask ask me and the other professionals that he hires about how he can better do that. So I think that absolutely, the song and the production are extremely important to the process, and and the 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 parameters that we're in as far as dynamic range go, we have to work within those parameters because that's the period we're in. Yeah, I mean, right right now, that's the period we're in, but I mean, what lifts a song is that, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's so many things that lift a song besides just how much it's a lot softer and how soft and loud it gets. It's all about what, the, you know, what the cool, what the cool synth line that comes into the guitar, the vocal melody moves up to, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just something that really makes the chorus explode more than just turning it up a DV, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know, so the idea, so back to the, the kind of the original question, talking about mixing and mastering, the difference between, you know, mixing side of things, you guys are worrying about, you're looking at balance. You're listening to the, the balance of the instrumentation. How are you going to get the sound across that's going to serve the song? The loudness kind of things. You know, uh, I did this panel, I, just, I said this a little bit ago, this uh, uh, with, uh, at AES this past year, and George Massenberg was on it, and he made this big quote. He said, uh, you know, comparison is the, uh, the, comparison is the root of all discontent which I think was a really good, very George-like, but a very good, uh, like a good point is that we look at the loudness a lot of times that that is the defining factor of whether it's a good song or not, but it's not. It's how does the balance work? How does the, how does the presentation of the instruments work for the, to get the, excuse me, <clears throat> to get the message across about what's going on with the song? I mean, right, 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 right now I just have to be able to do that and, and, and have it, and, and have it as loud as whatever, if I'm in an alternative, if I'm work, work, mixing for alternative rock, I just have to do all that, but I have to make sure it's as loud as the, as the last alternative rock hit because I got, they got to be able to play on the radio and, you know, and, and be consistent across. Or the, the, I mean, it won't sound as good or the radio guys won't play it, you know? And still keeping the quality of the song, like trying to keep the intent of the song yeah. at the same time. So you've got a delicate balance to work with there. Yeah. you got to be careful because, you know, you you got to look at who's driving driving this trend, you know? And if you're an engineer, an employed mixer, mastering engineer in today's business, it's, it, you know, it's like the balance of a mix. It's the balance of a song. You're also balancing art and commerce. You have to exist within your market. You have to get hired, and you have to stay hired, and you've got to keep your customers coming back to you. So, you know, it's interesting to look at who's driving the train here. And if you go, sure, sure, I'll make it loud, whatever, you know, you have that. Or you can put your foot down a little bit. Hey, you know. Here's how it should be, and maybe somebody has a little extra confidence. I've worked with some pretty big artists who have said, "We don't don't worry about that, you know, and we'll do something a different way." And they're big, so everybody will jump along that bandwagon. I've done that a number of times in my career, even almost almost dictating what happens with level for a little while, for you know, uh, the flavor of the month, and then something else will will pick it up from there. So, you know, you kind of have to decide who you are in the process of being employed in these trades, and it is a trade, you know, and, and how you're going to put your foot down and what you're willing to put at stake. In the beginning, it was interesting for me because I had nothing at stake. I was new. I was lucky enough to get employed at a, at a, at a you know, pretty reputable facility. And since I had nothing at stake and as a young kid, I kind of was like, okay, I'm not going to go for this crazy level thing. And then, you know, over time, as you get known, you know, I was the guy who maybe didn't have to get, travel down that road, so people get attracted that way. There's that law of attraction, you know, who, who you are and who you decide to be is a, very much a part of that mix. And I think if you look at all of these, these big dogs and these guys here and, and people out there doing it, the people who take a stand are the ones that really are, are driving the train here. Because, you know, you get young A&R people into the mix, and sometimes they get thrust into these positions, and they make a call. And if you, if you just have some confidence in who you are, you can have a dialogue, you can create a dialogue. Um, so uh, to me, that's an interesting point, and I think it's something to convey to, to people getting into the industry and maybe new people in the industry is really taking a stand on something because we exist in this world of limited dynamic range because of the external noise, and we're competing with so much other product now more than ever. Um, uh, go ahead, Mike. You just made a comment that I thought was great. It's confidence in what you're doing. I think that's something that every engineer should really have, no matter what stage you're at, is being able to be confident. You know, you're hired to do a job and be able to say that, I think that this is what my mixes should sound like. I'm done with my mix. Here it is. It represents it well. And I think that that's something that we sometimes find other ways to kind of get over on the confidence. Um, uh, we, we find other ways to, to maybe make ourselves feel a bit more secure about it by because it's as loud as a good thing or it's as bright as, as something like that. Um, so my question back to you guys then, do you, do you feel like, um, uh, do you get a chance to listen to the mastered versions when you're, done with, when you're done with a project and you send it off to mastering? Do you have final say on when it's complete? Do you hand it off at that point and just trust that it's done? Do you ever listen back and go, you know what, I think this is great, but... We need to do how, this a little bit. How too. do you AB when yeah. you get something back for the mastering? How do you yeah. do you so just feel it or do you finished? AB it with I, your mix? How I do you mean, do it? I just put, load it into the load it into a session with with what, what my, my elevated level was and and what the mastering ones and, and just AB set, offset them by a bar, switch back and forth. How do you do your gain structure? Do you, do you bring the mix up? Do you bring the master down? Do you split a little bit of both? Just, no, I use my. I, I mean, I'll use my elevated level and compare it against the master and. If I need, if I feel like mine's too loud, I'll, I'll pull mine down a half dB or something. But you know, I mean, I 
I, I'm usually not. I mean, I I mix my reference mixes that I'm sending to the band. I mix la. I mean, I'm up there in level, but I, you know, if I don't feel if I feel it's a project that doesn't need that much level, I'm usually setting those parameters on the on on what I'm on what the band's been listening to all along. I've had it down a little bit. Sometimes I like to use super elevated level is that's kind of an effect i'm cranking it so hard because I, I want that just massive distortion when the chorus hits sometimes that works to get a you know to get the constant the anger or whatever that is i'm trying to get across or the artist is trying to get across and i'm trying to help in the song sometimes that that's what i want but i'm just comparing back and forth to, to what my mix and i want it to just just make it a little better you know if it's yeah. not better it's like I, what, this is, you know, I'll make the phone call and say, sorry, man, this is not right. Let's try it again. I like what you say about turning yours down as compared to when it comes back from mastering. I think that's a interesting Yeah, point. I mean, I'll, sometimes <laughs> I'll pull mine down back a half dB or something, you know? I mean, I figure that, again, I'm going to a, a mastering engineer who I do. I know this is, I mean, I like I said, I make 400 plus songs a year. You guys, ma you know, master the that many songs here. This is all that you all do all day long. Hopefully, you, you know. I mean, you'll you'll be able to judge from the ref I send over. All right, Mark wanted this like really slam, but it, it can't be that slam. You know? Okay, yeah. Cal yeah. calm down. You know? Yeah. You're, maybe you're just a little out of control. Uh, again, like you were saying, whether or not, you know, being confident. In your, I mean, I'm. I always I always forge ahead with what I what I think is right 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 or wrong. I just awesome. I keep charging down the path, but um, and hopefully if you know if I've gone a little too far, you guys will tone it down or bring it up a little bit. Right. I mean, I, do you, you do a lot of records. That's that's. Uh, I saw I saw I saw a very funny thing on Facebook the other day. I wish I could remember it, but you know one of the, one of the one of the favorite <laughs> but it things made you laugh, that happens though, right? when you send something back for mastering it doesn't happen often, but it it comes up enough yeah. is the snare. You know, you do all your compression, you get all your level, you do all the stuff, mm -hmm. and the snare can sometimes get softened. It's such a pronounced instrument. Um, and uh, somebody had made a beautifully crafted one-sentence comment. I'm sure you guys have experienced, you know, what happens to the snare, and somebody was talking about the overall song and not the snare. I, I wish I could find the comment. It was very funny. But, you know, talking about how the stuff comes back from mastering, it doesn't matter about the snare, you know. You know that, that's one of those things too. When people say it's like putting things on on the masters on the master bus, and you know, doing the heated version, and some of the reasons I, I, I hear that people do that is they say that well, you know, I want to know how mastering is going to change my mix, uh, and. and Mastering can't change your mix. It's two channels. Mastering can change the perception of your mix, but it can't change the mix. And I think that that's a misconception. People think that this is going to change where the background vocals are, change you know, yeah. the quality of something because, and it's not. We're only dealing with two channels unless we're doing surround. It can't change the mix, just how it's perceived. Did you? Uh, you looked like you had your mic up and you had something to say. Did yeah. you? Did you? No, want to I, jump I in actually there? was going to say I completely agree. That's that's exactly what I do. Yeah. I I do it exactly the same way when I'm a being yeah, yeah. the master. People have different techniques. You know, we work as mastering engineers. We work with so many um, different producers, engineers, and it's always interesting to me. I, I work with some very well-known producers who I'll run into some months later, and you know they don't. Usually, when you don't get the call, they love it. If you don't hear back from somebody, everybody's so busy. You know, if you don't hear back, they love it. It's how it works. And I'll run into you know one of these one of these people and. I'll say, hey, so what did you think of the thing? Oh, yeah, I haven't heard it yet. Meanwhile, it's a hit on the radio, you know? And they haven't heard what I did yet. So there's that. Then there's the... It must well, that's be they, then there's, you know, well, that's it's when they send it, it to me and it, I redo your actually, work. And then, no, I'm just kidding. It actually puts more pressure on you because, you know, you, they're not listening. you got to really get it right, you know? I mean, you got to get it right anyway, but you know what I'm saying. Um, but then you get the people that A, B it critically, and it's about the snare, and it's, you know, you, you dissect it and everything else in between. Um, so anyway, I don't go crazy at it. It's like I just look it up. I, I, I is it better? You got to feel it. Is it not better? Yeah, it, it, That's it, it, does it still yes move you. Yeah, yeah, does it? Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? We got one in the front here. Why don't you yeah, guys line get, up on the mic? Because we're running out of time and we want to hit everybody. So oh, let's take the quick, first one. Awesome. Yeah. And direct, direct, maybe just say who you are, where you're from, and direct uh, my your name's question. Eric. I'm from Austin, and I had a couple of questions for you guys. Uh, first question was: Can you talk a little bit about placement? In the mix, uh, we put out a CD that everything just, and I've heard other CDs where everything just sounds like it was thrown up against the wall and was very flat. Like the first Bad Brains record that Rick Ocasek produced. And then the next record that came out, everything sat well in the mix. And if you could talk a little bit about achieving that technique. And the other question I have was, a lot of the mastering guys that I talked to 
will do something at 5,000 and 7,000 K. So do you guys maybe do your pre-master to make their job easier or make to where they don't have to do that? Guys, um, if, if we could do this, um, ask all your questions. And, and since we want to try to get everybody before we run out of time, which is pretty soon, maybe uh, we could take one of each person can get one of the questions answered. But you can ask multiple and, and direct the question. And, and let's see where it goes. OK. I actually had two as well, um, but they're very short. But can we hit him first? Can we get back to him first? And then uh, oh, sure. let's answer his question for him. Uh, I think that was for you guys, wasn't it? Was that for for us? Well, it's about for you? do you do you pre? I guess like kind of what on the mastering side of things, or do you do anything to make to try to make our job easier? Pre pre do some EQ work or something? Is that what you were saying about the? Why do we, we don't necessarily do that, so I don't know. I'm not sure I understand no, that's, the question. No, that's not something. You, you know, yeah, each, each song is dependent on, you know, you just use your tools and your ears to decide what needs to happen uh, for for each individual song. There's no there's no roadmap. I, I, I have to admit that, that I, I, I plan in my ears what the mastering guy is going to do. Um, so I may not... In my master version, not my, my fake master, <laughs> but in my master version, I may not push as much top as I, as I want him to act, because I want some space for the mastering guys to do their thing. So if I'm pushing too much top in my master, then they're going to be kind of boxed in. Um, so I will, I will consider that. Uh, you know, um, yeah. You shape it for who's... Who, who it's going to go to. We, these relationships are relationships we rely on. You know, I know the, the curve of these guys' mixes. And what's interesting is that nobody else does. You know, the, this stuff does not go out to the public until it's gone through the mastering process. So these relationships are very tightly formed and very, they're, they're actually very intimate relationships. Yeah, we develop them over time and we get to know each other over time. And um, I, I get that all the time, people mixing for what it is I'm going to do. Also the opposite, people just you know, I, I actually get calls from new people that come in and say, you know, what should I do? Should I take the compressor off the bus? And I, I'll, I'll say, look, make it sound as good as you can make it sound so that you don't need me. You're always going to have, I'm always going to have to do something to take it to that place to get released. You know, being the mastering engineer, meaning any mastering engineer has to do that. Um, but make it sound like you don't need me and start there. Don't, don't shape it for me if you don't know me. Let's let's do ten, maybe twenty records together before we go down that road. And that I think is what Tony's talking about. Yeah, own, own it's your an mix. intimate relationship. Be confident and say back to the confidence. Own it and say like that. We think this sounds good. This is a finished mix. Don't presuppose that we're going to do something or not do something to it. Yeah. Awesome. A um, couple quick questions I had. Once for the mastering engineers and the others for the mixing engineers. Um, Tony, you actually mentioned that you see people kind of moving away into it, into a kind of a different era of sound, so to speak. Um, could you give us some examples about where you think that the general sound of popular music is going? Um, and for the mastering engineers, I will typically think that negative 3 dB is enough headroom to send to a mastering engineer if I'm not mastering it myself. How much headroom do you all want? How much do you feel is appropriate? I'd like to hear the answer to that second question first, actually. Awesome. Because <laughs> well, minus three is hot. Y you know, That's pretty hot, yeah. But the way I look at it, I don't look at the technicals at all. I, you know, if your peaks, if everything's feeling good, dynamically speaking, to you, and you have confidence in what you're doing, I love working with you. If, if you don't have confidence in what you're doing, I then have to take time, and we have conversations, and blah, blah, blah. And it's really not, not the way to do business. Um, you know, to take a stand is how to do it. So get that dynamic feeling right and and let those peaks live in a space that makes sense to live so I, 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 for me personally and and people can argue with this it's my point of view it's not a fact by any means let let those pe peaks tickle zero maybe bring it down a little bit if you come down too too low you're not using all your dynamic uh, bit range you know so <laughs> it, it's really just about feel to me and um, you know maximizing it but letting the dynamic be what you want it to be very close, if not everything, how you want to get it back from me as well. Uh, don't slam anything ever. No, 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 no. There's never a no, reason no, to slam anything. No, don't slam it and then just bring the master fader down. That no, does, no, that's no. not the same thing. 
Yeah, no, you, I, I would say that bring some, give it some give it headroom. So you said three, okay, cool. Six is great. Twelve, if you want. Classical music would be different than a rock record, you know. So it's dependent on what you're doing. N knowing that if we're going to EQ something, EQ is e even at that is even if there's no dynamics. Let's say it's a jazz record or a classical record that you don't want it. You're not going to approach it the same way. Um, any EQ is still energy that's going to be either added or subtracted, so you've got to have room to add to to change the energy amount that's going on there. At full zero dBFS, you've got you know you've only got this you've got this ceiling. L leave some zeros in there, you know. That's what I'm saying. So give it give it a little bit of give it a little bit of room that's appropriate to what's going on, like Gavin's saying. But you know, but uh, don't just run the master fader all the way, you know, square it off, make sausage out of it, and then turn it down. That's not the same thing. Yeah, because we can turn it down just the way you can. It's, yeah. There's no diff. Also keep the to carry as well. That's yeah, use your yeah, body to feel it. Use your, your, yeah. your mind and body to feel it and get it cooking and light up the rum and send it over. Headroom is great. gives us room to work without having to do something to it before we can get started. And the answer to the other part of your question is that in every era, Technology has either played a role just in sound quality or the manipulation of sound itself, right? So if, if, you know, if the first people to use, you know, 30 Ips tape uh, said, wow, this is sounding great, I can record at this level and it still feels wonderful, blah, blah, blah. Um, then there was always the other guy who said, I'm going to blast this tape and do X, Y, Z. And it's the same thing for every era of technology. So my point is that now we have, you know, as Mark said, you know, to him, it's like, I might want it to blow up in the hook. I might want you to not even be able to make out what the words are because I want you to feel the sound. Right? So it's the same thing. The same idea and technique was done with every era of technical, technological growth. Everyone pushed the limits to try to figure out why it sounded better. And, and that's kind of what that's about. Yeah, we that's see that with tape all the time. That, you know, absolutely. Depending on the band, you just like, never left the red sometimes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, depended on the situation. The that, that's probably the best point all day on the panel here. You, you know, you really take of the day, stay current, yeah. and that's probably the message of this panel. You know, stay current, but be responsible. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I have two questions as well. Uh, my name is Laron. I'm from Kentucky. Um, Can you talk into the mic a little more? You're yeah, quiet there. A big issue I've had over the past year or so is um, when you get the mix how you want it. What's a standard dB level for radio ready, and how effective is this new program called Lander? Oh, uh, wow. All right. <laughs> okay, radio. Here's the thing there's about a, radio. There's a myth right there. Let's dispel well, that right away. Well, here's the thing about radio. Every, they, they've loaded up with compressors and de -essers. And here's the reality, and you can take this to the bank. The lower level your master is, the better it's going to sound on radio. They level everything. It doesn't matter what you give them. They, they bring it into their range. So they're mastering it, really, if you think about it that way. So if you want your stuff to sound bigger on the radio, don't worry about getting a loud compressed master. And they've always done that. Always. Yeah. always. It's yeah. never going to be different. the beginning of radio. But, always. but I'm going to say something else. So now there's all types of legislation happening because the internet and bandwidth companies are trying to buy all of this bandwidth. And radio is also misbehaving in terms of how they pay royalties towards artists. They don't pay for performance royalties. They pay for writers only in this country. America, North Korea, and Iran are the three countries that do not pay performance royalties to artists. So, you know, like anything else that gets too big, it collapses eventually. So we're not going to worry about radio too much longer, I don't think. But anyway, that's the deal with radio. But Lander, well, Lander, is, Lander is something, I'll just say this quickly and I'll hand it off. I've had several times I've had speaker companies come to my studio to, to let us hear speakers. And they come in with these measuring devices, they shoot pink noise in the room, and they come up with what they deem a perfect balance. Speakers sound terrible. I go in there with a little tweaker. I, pull the, I usually pull the high end down on these tweeters. Everything sounds better, and they get very upset because the curve is wrong. So if you look at every note of music I've ever worked on in my 25 years doing this, it's probably all wrong. But yet, a lot of people love it, 
and I've managed to stay employed. And it's probably the case with everybody doing records. So you get a, co a company like Lander. I, I support the concept of it, I really do. Um, but when you have an automated system looking at your music, you come up with these perfect curves, but you have to have some human wrongness in this thing. And I could go into that, but I, in the interest of time, I'll hand it off. But that's, that's really where I'm coming from on it. I was just going to relate to what you were talking about. You know, when you talk about uh, radio, and, and I, I actually I think radio is going to be around for a while in its, in its form. So, um, but it's a very similar that that compression thinking that you have to make it loud to make it sound great, on, sound big on the radio is exactly backwards. The same way that trying to make something loud sounds good with a lossy compressed audio file. Taking something like an MP3 or an AAC file, and you're you're taking away so much data that you you've got to you've got to it uh, it actually sounds they can sound not so awful if you've got some dynamic range into them. Sometimes you get that where people say, "Hey, can you make that really make it really loud? Because I need to make a good sounding MP3," which is uh, oxymoron at its own. Um, but back to the <laughs> back to the. Uh, um, the thought about Lander, the other thing too, those, those kinds of services, you know, we were, we were talking about this, uh, you know, uh, a few minutes ago, the idea of the trust that gets built up between the mix engineer and the mastering engineer. There's a dialogue, there's an understanding that's going on. And these companies, although uh, getting something done, getting, getting mastering taken care of like that, if you, if you can't go to one of us, you know, it's not a bad idea, but you, you have to realize that there, you know, it's, it is, it's just a, it's a curve without any humanity. Art, you know, art itself is the imperfections of the human human experience. You know, vocalists that may not be completely in pitch, but they're very expressive. Timing of a drummer or a band that might vary just a little bit, rather than beat detecting things up. That's the human factor of it. And also the dynamic range. Those are the things that allow us to be able to connect to the music as an art form. And when we take all that stuff away, we start to lose the art. So yeah. I just say be da be careful about that. I mean, if I was gonna, if I had the choice between, if I if I wasn't gonna have a, have to have an actual mastering engineer do it, I had the choice between just using what I did and using Lander. Yeah. I just like just use my just just use my my elevated level file. I got it already, you know, uh, because I already. I mean, I've already got it. I, you know, I've got it within a few, you know, five, ten percent of exactly what I want it to be. You know, I don't want, I don't want a machine trying to figure it out for me. You've got a lot of A and R people that are embracing Lander now, uh, especially the new crop coming in, who um, see it, and they're very aggressive in, in their marketing campaign, by the way, because they're presenting themselves as an easy solution for something, and they're targeting people that don't understand the process. So I don't that's know what I'm Lander is. <laughs> Lander is an automated mastering. You yeah. plug it in online. They, you they you analyze send the waveform and they send it back for thirty bucks. They can't put ISRC codes in it. They can't make DDP masters. What about cutting flat. lackers? Do I mean, that. Yeah. <laughs> that there's the final that right shit there. Shit is whacked. <laughs> is the quote of the day. So, all right. Don't do that. Yeah, I, I've tried Lander. It's terrible. Terrible. Um, anyway, my name is Connor Smith. I'm from Orlando. I just want to first say thank you. You guys are heroes in my book, so thanks for being here on the panel. But, but can I just say we do need to support what Lander means. We we need to yeah. we need to support like like Tony has been pointing out all day. You know, technology is moving on, and if you just if you stop at some point, it's just going to go. If you don't cannibalize yourself, somebody is going to cannibalize you. You've got to embrace all of these things that come in. You've got to invent them. You've got to support them. It is important, we, and and that. And responsible people doing that is what's going to make these things better. And if you look at a lot of successful things, they started out people saying, "Oh, this sucks, this sucks." It doesn't. Conceptually, we got to get into it. So, but you know. All right, I didn't mean that it sucked. No, 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 no. I'm, I, 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 yeah, I'm with you no, because I, I'm going to go with because you. we got to get this but stuff sounding well, right. They use an algorithm. Well, it's like no, a, it's no, like no, a drive-through versus just, a restaurant. But you know, what, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like it'd be good if I had it on two tracks and I could use it on a parallel but we, and yeah. send some crazy shit to it. That sounds like it'd be fun. See, see that's but what you're saying though, that's, that's, that's mix, creativity. That I ain't never going to do that. But what you're saying here is is actually great because we we're talking about the concept of it, and then you're saying, hey, you know. Uh, and and that's what right. it takes. You you get into it. A parallel. You get into it and you make the best of it and you work with it. Maybe we get to know the people doing it. You know, you get into it. So so this is actually good stuff. This is really to me it's supportive. But anyway, your question. So uh, I've had the uh, the honor of working under Greg Calby and uh, Bob Katz, uh, just studying under them. And uh, two completely different approaches. You know, one takes out the calculator, the other closes his eyes and turns the knobs. I think you know which one does what. Right. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, Tony, I've been trying to mimic your mixes for years, uh, and I just can't do it because I'm not you. And uh, I think this is something that some of my colleagues share, you know, trying to find our identity in the mix. 
And I just wanted to know if you had any advice just for up and coming engineers or people just saying, you know, what makes a mix your own mix? It's the shape of my head. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. Right. You can't, you can't, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not only how I'm hearing it, it's not only the, the physicality that the sound goes into, um, it's, it's, it's the history of emotional connection to the music, right? Mm -hmm. and, and as Gavin just said, we have to kind of make it our own. You know, everyone up here has their own style, has their own thing. And, and I learned, you know, I, I did the same thing. Right. I, I mimicked my heroes. And I studied them, and I wanted to be them. Um, and if I, if I could have transported myself into their their physicality, I probably would have done that too. Um, but but what ended up being good about that is that realizing that I could never mimic them. Finally, when I realized right. that, I also realized that the practice that I went through. To try to mimic them made you better, or you found your own identity in doing that. that that's correct. Right. I realized I found places that I thought were them. When I tried to mimic, you know, uh, what I thought was a Bob Clearmountain snare drum, I'm sure I was not at all close <laughs> to the choices that he made in his in his equalization and compression. But to my ear, it was close, and. And sonically, I mean, but I went, I'm sure I went about it a different way. So my point is that yes, it's a very positive thing to practice, to be something you think is good. Every guitar player, every musician has practiced their hero. And, and the same goes with technicians and producers. Um, so it's it's a good awesome. thing to be doing that. Thank you. And I was gonna keep trying to emulate ones. you, but I'm finding my own thing. Yeah. I was, was going to ask this, uh, you, and you kind of touched on this. Ask you a question back and say, "Are you a musician? Do you also play? Yeah. Do you play?" So when you started learning to play, did you start to play like other people to figure out licks and things like that? And yeah. then you become the sum of the your inspirations and become the sum of your parts. Same same. Yeah. Kind of thing. Hey guys, we've got a three minute warning, and we got three people. Let's try to do a minute a question here. All right. All right, Stratton Tingle from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, it's important for me to use local uh, providers whenever possible. I'm an artist. Um, I'm also representing Soundcore, which is building a music economy of Chattanooga. So that's hence the local providers. Something that I'm finding that people don't have a lot of, um, that my people don't have a lot of experience with is in, um, as an artist, I'm planning a project which I want to be, uh, I, I want a remix album made by various, you know, dance artists, basically. Do you all have a process for doing something like that? Um, exporting stems and stuff, and if this is totally Googleable, then just let me know that. I mean, for, I, I, I mean the way we do it now. I mean, what we'll run, you know, just your basic split out instrumental stems. But you know, with with Pro Tools 11, now that we can bounce off live as well, I'm usually just take we just take the whole session, even if it's 130 tracks, and the standard. I just stem out the whole thing and say, here you go, put everything to zero. And, I, and okay. you know, because it makes it a lot easier for the dance guys. So well, that, that's kind of what we do now. We just stem the whole session out to you. Cool. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Lucas Capistani. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Um, I just was wondering, since audio engineering is a field that I've heard is very, because uh, I'm studying at Musicians Institute, um, but I've heard it's very apprentice based. Um, you kind of learn from somebody who's already doing it. Um, but I'm curious, since so many people are mixing their own stuff nowadays, how important is it to, uh, in your mind, to uh, practice on, uh, I guess, higher end or nicer equipment? Or do you think, I mean, of course there's a difference, I would say, but like how, how big of a difference would you say uh, expensive piece of equipment is compared to something like average piece of mixing equipment? Or I, I mean, I never apprenticed. I, I started just, I just started my own studio and convinced people I knew what I was do, doing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, 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 I mean, I don't think, I, I mean, there's so much available with an Apollo and a laptop. You know, I, I mean, you could. I mean, you can basically duplicate everything I'm using to mix records right now. If you, you know, I'm, I have, I have like eight octo cards, and, and a little, so I might have a little more power. But I mean, you can, you can get all the same stuff I'm using, and just do it in your bedroom. You know, 
It's who, it's who you are, you know? It's yeah. really who you are. You have to look at that. And when you talk about apprenticing, uh, you have to be careful about that process, too, because a lot of people are uh, taking internships in, and, you know, it, it really has to be a two-way street. You have to take something from an internship, and you have to give something, and that's the way the relationship will work. And if it is imbalanced on either side of those, it will be an unsustainable relationship. So to take something is... It, is generally that sense of confidence, that experience, working under somebody who has experience, learning how they approach their uh, their work, not only in terms of how they shape their sound, but how they manage to gain clients and keep clients. You know, it's an art unto itself. Yeah, as long as you're and learning something besides how to get lunch, you know? But, you know? But if, you're, if you're really learning something, how, how a studio works, how to interact with artists, I mean, that's one of the most important things. When I, if I, when I get an assistant, it's because I've, I mean, I've worked with him in another studio, and it's like, I know this guy knows how to get along with artists. He knows how to be cool in a room. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, that's one of the things I probably look for more than, you know, do you know what, what this EQ does? Are you cool to hang with? And are you not going to piss out the artists off, you know, or me? <laughs> you know, just be like, cool. I mean, that, that's kind of the main thing I, I, I look for when I'm hiring somebody. Um, and back to your question about the, uh, you know, I think Gavin's right, oh, oh, you know, it, it's about who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. Like, yeah. you know, the tools themselves are not, are, are not the, they're just a means to get the job done. You have to start with a thing, a practice, like, uh, a men, or, or an opinion, I think it needs to do this, and then use the tools to get there with what you have. Uh, it'd be like a, um, if you were a professional pool player and you had a bent cue, you'd still probably kick the ass of somebody who really has a, the best pool cue ever, but doesn't know what they're doing. Final question. First of all, you guys are absolute legends, and be, you, you are the most important people behind the sound, especially with the mastering engineers and the mixers and the producers, the unsung heroes, really make things sound huge. Um, I'm Gino Burjo. I'm a, I produce and mix, and I also do my own artistry for Gabriel BJ Music. And I'm just kind of curious, because with the basic trends that you've seen, more so from, the, from mixing and producing, in the way that the industry is going, what are some hats that a young mixing engineer should be really cognizant of to make sure that they're involved with things that are probably going to, you know, based on the trends, would be really important areas to be on top of? Kind of like the, you mentioned uh, the, the songwriter who also produced for, the, for Nick Jonas in that song. So what are some of the different hats? Uh, for me, uh, I, I kind of, I really like the fact that I have a, a mastering engineer, a producer, an artist. I like them being different humans. Um, I, when I produce, I don't engineer. When I, I, I would never consider mastering. Um, I, I think that, that whether it's just the way that I've come up and the way that I think that human interaction is part of the collaborative process of making music, um, I, I think that I don't want to wear a lot of hats. Or if I do, I want just, like, I'll wear all the hats, but only one at a time, you know? Um, it's just the way I feel. Um, but I think that uh, we have this propensity in the modern world for everyone to do everything. And, and it's not, I think it's problematic, to say the least. I think um, we're out of time here. Um, it, oh, do you want to go ahead, Mark? No, no, I'm, uh, I'm you know, no, I was at the thing. Did, did, does any of the two panelists here have anything specific in, on, on, on their minds before we uh, do our thank yous? Yeah, anything come up that uh, sparked a well, thought? Well, uh, for me, you know, I think that, you know, this panel has touched upon several things regarding uh, the process of making music and, and the finishing of it, which is what the four of us do. Um, and and, and that, that process exists because um, people have relied on, on, on a, this collaboration to bring up the level into presentation. Um, and I think that we are embarking on a new world where where things are able to be presented has changed. But, and, and, in, and in some ways, the players involved in that development of that presentation are changing, and, and people are wearing different hats or multiple hats and things like that. But, but I think that 
ultimately the, the, the elements of how music is created, developed, and then presented are structurally similar. Um, and, and I think that this process of collaboration that we've gotten used to is developing. I don't know how, what those elements are going to be in our future of making music, but I think that uh, an informed, um, uh, should I say, uh, younger generation of music makers really should remember that that collaboration has got to be there. I don't know what forms it's going to take, and I don't know if the four of us will be part of that, but I do think that you as, as young music maker, makers need to remember that the collaboration is really a huge part of it. Um, because, you know, Mark will make a mix that we will, won't talk about at all, but I will listen to his mix and say, I get what he did on this I thing. Like this. Do you know what I'm saying? Like that right there is pure genius. I'm gonna copy that until it's old. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's just the collaboration is what it's about. So don't try to do everything is all I've got to add to this discussion. Because I, I don't do everything myself. I'm copying him. I'm copying my contemporaries, my colleagues. I'm copying what he does what he does when, just so I, when I send it to my client, I'm like, uh, yeah, I heard he did this, so <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we're gonna send it to him, the master, but this is what he uses, you know what I'm saying? I, like, I'll take the edge any place I can get the edge. I just bought the Tony Maserati Waves plug-in, that's all I do. <laughs> and it works, as long as you purchase it and don't, don't jack it, but... <laughs> But, uh, you know, to me, that's an added thing that I think is important here. The, the, the other thing I'd say for, you know, for people who are just kind of starting in the mixing is if you're starting a mixed career, a producing career, just, you know, get a concept that, that, you, that, that you feel is working with the song. And sometimes that, that concept will develop as you're going. You'll be end up yeah. going left or right. But just but forge ahead, finish something, listen back to it, move on to the next, rather than because I see people who get caught up on... The one song they've been redoing they, they've over been mixing it and over and 25 over. ways. It's been uh, six months or yeah, yeah. you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, just, just I mean, finish that one, move ahead. Okay, it's, th 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 then you can use that to figure out what you did wrong when you do the next. But you know, I, I mean, I, I just right or wrong, I just I move, I move, keep moving forward, you know, and ho hopefully I'm right more often than not. But <laughs> awesome, always moving forward. Collaborations, humans, art. Again, back to that. We have to keep growing, keep learning from each other. Um, with that, well then, thank you guys very much. Thank you guys for being here. Really want to thank Mark, thank Tony, thank Gavin, thank Melissa and all the great folks at South by Southwest for allowing us to have this. And we really want to thank you guys for being here, asking great questions and being part of this. So thank you guys very much. Hope you have a really great rest of the, the festival and see you next year. And thanks to the